Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Nature's Image Farm podcast. Hope you're having a great weekend. It's been uh, crazy busy around here. And I didn't turn my phone off, so you get to hear that twice. <laughs> I swear we've done this before. Nah, only once or twice. What's well, uh, a lot of snowy and icy weather all over the place, all over sure the country. Is. And uh, I'm sure a lot of folks have been uh, busy getting that cleaned up or trying to push through uh, their homestead projects or maybe even figuring out how to get out there and get the critters fed and watered. That's right. Well, we've got a lot of folks joining us tonight. Want to uh, get some shout outs in. We got our friend uh, Tennessee Tim McCandless, hey, Southeast Tim. Homestead, uh, Keith Spillman. Good to see you, Keith. Roy Adams from Adams Outdoors. We've got Chris from Drop Tie and Farms. Uh, we've got our pal Randy over at the Trails Inn Farms. S and J Honey. St oh, it's Steve and Jane. S and J Honey. Good to see you guys. Our neighbors here in Hopewell. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Thomas from West Virginia. Jeff, uh, good to see you in here. Uh, Jeff, I hope you can make it out to the uh, Mountaineers Beekeeping Conference here in the spring. We're looking forward to uh, speaking there and uh, seeing everybody and, and having a good time. Yeah. Um, that's going to be awesome. We've got Grandma Terry in the house. Good to see you, Granny. Charlie Vance, uh, West Virginia Hillbilly Honey. Charlie, it's going to be great seeing you at the West Virginia Beekeeping Conference, too. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. Uh, Tar Hill Beekeeper, Randy, good to see you. Miss Hannah Costello, good to see you in there. We haven't Hannah, seen her for a little while, have we? Oh, I miss you, Hannah. I've got our buddy uh, Thomas from Free Range Art Farm. Uh, we've got uh, J&D's Bees, good evening. Ina Hatcher, Michelle Irwin, nice to see you. We saw Michelle at the um, Hive Life Conference. That was pretty cool. Uh, we've got Lee from Kodiak Farms, good to see you, Lee. Mark McCaffrey. Hope Sadler, Pappy Richard. Good to see you, Pappy. Uh, I did a little interview with uh, Pappy Richard. Go check out his YouTube channel, and uh, you can kind of learn more about what it means. What does Be the Lighthouse really mean? So go check out Pappy Richard's YouTube channel and find out. We've got three boys, Bees, Justin Johnson, a Cajun homestead and beekeeping. Good to see you. Uh, David Scott Boren, the man, the myth, the legend. Good to see you in there, Scott. Uh, Brian Lee, uh, good to see you, Brian. Do you remember Brian and, and his sons? And they did oh, the, uh, the so trade. Oh, they're so fun. Oh, Wasn't that fun? He's got two good boys. That was a, they. Uh, they did that that sticker or that that trade thing where you start off with you know something. He could start off free, with a penny something, and then and you just trade up, trade you just up, keep trade trading up. up. That, was, yep. that was pretty cool. Uh, we got our buddy Phil from Cedar Ridge Bees. Uh, oh, Michelle. Sp so we have Keith and Michelle Spillman. They must have enough internet so they both can get on. That's pretty cool. We kicked all everybody off ours. Oh, we have our buddy Ian Stepler, the Canadian Beekeepers blog. Uh, beautiful day up here today. Ian, I wonder how much uh, if you got, I think we were all kind of getting a, a snow belt that kind of went uh, straight east for the most part. I saw he's got a good coating. Yeah. yeah. Yep, he sure did. Uh, Alan Blanton, good to see you. Uh, Greg Dunn, good to see you in here too. We have our buddy Sebastian um, all the way from the other side of the ocean, beekeeping and gardening. Good to see you. Oh, wow. We've got uh, uh, Terry's got Jeffy in the house, too. Uh oh, okay. Uh, Curtis Smith. He must not be asleep yet. Curtis from Michigan. Uh, good to see you. Mr. Jonathan Bennett. Nice to have you in here tonight. And what is this? The one and only, maybe making its first live stream appearance, Honey Money TV. What? Is Honey Money TV, might you ask? Well, I think you better go over at some point tonight after the after the live chat and go check out and see what Honey Money TV is all about. I think it's going to blow your socks off. Nice. Cool stuff. Oh, I'm so excited. We've got our local buddy, uh, Steve Moody uh, from Moody Hives. Good to see you in there, Steve. Oh, hi, Steve. We've got uh, Hickory Hives. And uh, let's see. I think we've got everybody caught up. Oh, Get and we've got... Oh, uh, we got Castle Hives, Brian Coper, walls, 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 <laughs> times three. Oh. What on earth is he talking about? I don't know. So what did you, what have you been up to this weekend? I think I, I think that's a lead in to what, what we're uh, talking about here. That's a, a real good tie in for uh, what's going on. Well, it's, you know, it's been going on. With we you, have Greg. been just uh, busy, hard at it, uh, trying to get the next phase. Did you say busy as a bee? 
I would say busy as a bee, you know? <laughs> I wish I had, I don't have very good chicken puns. I gotta work on that. Uh, what would you say? Busy at the, uh, I don't No, let's stop nothing, there. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, um, if you're uh, if you're uh, just uh, tuning into us for the first time, I want to welcome you. Thanks for joining us here at the Nature's Image Farm Podcast. Um, if, if you don't uh, know who we are, uh, my wife Susie in here. We have seven kids that we raise here on the homestead. Uh, beekeeping is our business, and uh, here on the homestead, we do everything. We've had the the joy uh, and the opportunity to just do all the different things on the homestead: saw milling and ma making make, uh, maple syrup and raising chickens and goats and ducks and turkeys and pigs and cows and sheep, cats, cats, lots dog, of cats, a dog or too lots and lots of cats lots of cats rabbits lots right uh, lots of that i think we've tried just about everything that's the homesteaders way you just throw it yeah. all against the wall you see what sticks you see what resonates with you and then you kind of just uh or at least what you can keep alive dial it in there yeah and so um on <laughs> we as as we've been growing our bee business um one thing that we do here is we offer free hands-on learning um for um all of our new and packaged customers and it's also free for military veterans um, it's a way that we can support those that support us. Um, and it's a way that we can serve those that served our country. Um, and so in doing so, we had a supply shop that we kind of put together so we can sell wax up equipment and premier frames and foundation and a lot of just the beekeeping basic supplies. And then we we kind of meet every other Saturday and we'll talk about bees and um, whatever's happening currently uh, um, out in the bee yards, you know, in our local area. And then we'll take that information and go right out to the bee yard and learn hands on all together. Yeah. Um, and it's a fun way where we can just kind of learn bees together, uh, grow the community. Um, it's just a really fun way. And it's a little bit different of, a, of an approach um, when it comes to this kind of community style um, beekeeping. You've heard of community supported agriculture. Um, you've heard of community gardens. It's This is kind of the same thing. Um, and so we've kind of grown a little faster than we, we thought we would. And so we've been busy um, on phase two, which is uh, putting a much bigger supply shop and classroom together. Yeah. And I guess I don't know if this is probably not the not the place to probably do it. Um, but we have been busy. Yeah. Getting um, phase two. They probably can't see this. This is probably going to be annoying. This is. But okay. That's, no, that's okay. That's no, not bad. That's, well, there's the ring light. Well, I, so I'm, let's not, not, I'm not good yeah. at this. Well, we've we've got phase two. <laughs> Um, dried in and framed in, and we've been busy building walls. We've got the final front walls and the man door and the bay door and uh, the kind of the separator between the warehouse and the shops all kind of set up. Uh, so big thanks to Jeff. And uh, we've got uh, Brian was out helping today. And of course, Izzy and Jake were out just working as a team, kind of getting that done. So we've been out in the sleet and the snow all day. Um, yeah. And why walls. would you have done it on a weekend like this weekend that was so cold? What temperature did you look at? Did you look at a forecast different than what it was supposed to be? Well, so I was I was down in Charlotte um, earlier this week, <laughs> Charlotte, North Carolina. And I was thinking, man, I really need to get this wall knocked out. And um, I just. That let me check the weather, make sure everything is going to be cool. Yeah. Um, and it was saying like. 54 degrees, 57 degrees. And He's I thought like, this yes. is going to be perfect. Yeah. We'll get out there. What well, was going to be great. And um, that was uh, one of those. Because I was looking at Charlotte's weather. And I'm thinking, wow, he Ohio is weather. really wanting to really do some cold winter work. Yeah. And well, he's like, oh, no, we're going to get all this done. We're gonna get so much done. And I'm thinking you're going to be exhausted in like a few hours of trying to work in this cold weather. But it's, OK. Yeah. Well, so anyways, so we uh, made a material run. And as I'm driving back, I'm thinking man, it's getting cold pretty quick. Yeah. And then uh, we stopped at Menards and uh, loaded up on two by sixes and all the things that we needed to do what we needed to do. And uh, then I checked the weather. I'm thinking, oh, man. It's like supposed to be in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, not Fahrenheit. as nice as you wanted it not, to be. So, but. yeah. So, totally wrong forecast. Um, but as anyone, um, all of you out here listening, you're either living on a homestead um, or you're, you're doing some things in the backyard. You know how this goes. Maybe you're, you're on a farm. There's never enough time. And you have to take advantage of the time when you have it, whatever that it looks like. That's true. And um, if it was nicer out, I'd want to be working on going through bees and checking up on this and checking on that. So that's true. Um, 
uh, you have to take advantage of the time that you have. So that's what we we did is, is we got that knocked out and we were getting so close uh, to really getting that where we need to be um, for April. So it's one of those things where if you're on, if you're, if you live this kind of lifestyle, you know that you do, you push, you dig. Um, and then sometimes you'll notice like you'll get it done like one day before go time. And you, you tell yourself, oh my gosh, if I didn't push hard and dig in on that through the ice and the snow and all this kind of things, we wouldn't have got this done. So today was one of those days where we could have just maybe decided to edit some videos or stay, you know, do some, you know, inside type stuff. But no, we decided to go out there and just get that done, take advantage of the time. And well, you that's did. What we did. I stayed inside with the what rest were, of the kids. What were you up to today, Susie? <laughs> well, uh, let's see. We've got a couple loaves of bread baked. The the whole wheat bread is in uh, finishing baking right now. So I smells smell good, that. Yeah. And we got, uh, we're just working on paperwork and getting the house together back in order for homeschooling, uh, which we continue even when we're disorganized, just not as efficiently as when we're organized. So um, just lots of paperwork for businesses and, you know, all the like really boring stuff that Greg doesn't like to do. He likes to be outside and I'm the one that has to keep everything on the inside up and going. So yeah, uh, just boring stuff, really. I mean, it's nothing that is fun. And I kept everybody fed. So and, fed, and, and alive. hot coffee. That's that's worth an awful lot. Hot coffee. Um, we did chili last night. We did a nice roast tonight and sweet potatoes. So that was nice yummy. beef roast. And I think that yeah. was, that was from um, those that are the Dexter cows that we still had some of that left. A little somehow. bit left. Yeah, I know. It's like weird because it just gets lost in freezer space, but it was really well kept. So the, the vacuum sealing worked on those. Now, it doesn't work every time, but that was nice to have. Um, it's always nice to have beef in the freezer. So, so yeah. So you've been busy in the kitchen and, and yeah. keeping everyone uh, happy here um, at the house. And we've been out at the farm just uh, getting it done. And uh, got a shout out to uh, both uh, Drop Time Chris uh, and Roy Adams. Their 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 hammers were lonely. It sounds oh. like guys. Oh, there's I, way more to I, do. I, I it's right. <laughs> I I am saving my phone a friend card. Um, Are you gonna save your phone a friend? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna save that for a little bit later. We're going to uh, uh, big exciting news. I finally decided to. Uh, well, there's, that's a whole long story. But okay. when we get into the rest of this year, we're going to talk about some sawmilling and things like that, too. Well, that's not the topic for tonight. No, it's not. So. But when we start getting those uh, logs sawed up um, so we can use that siding um, inside of the shop and out front, um, there's going to be a whole lot of rough cut to put up. So uh, Roy Yeehaw. and Chris, believe me, <laughs> you'll, your hammers will get a workout. Oh, yeah. Depending on what you're trying to hammer through, they'll get a real workout. So will your arm. <laughs> we got a, a couple other folks um, uh, checking in. We've got our, our buddy Rob Pollock at LaRabi's. We've got um, Lisa uh, Gowan, Grammy's Midwife Suburban Homestead, Jimmy Warmer. Uh, let's see. And a Flower Street Farm Bees. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I, I love that everyone can take a little time and just kind of hang out with us today. Have you been paying attention to current events? I've, if you haven't, if you've just at least gone to the grocery store in the last month or so, I would think you would know what we're going to talk about. I, I don't think even if you want to hide, um, hide out on the homestead and totally stay away from the news channels, which is uh, totally, fine. totally me. Um, usually when I see the news, it's, it's, it's someone sharing a Facebook post or, um, someone will say, Hey, did you see this? Because they know I don't watch the news. I don't care to watch the news. And, um, so I usually get my, uh, most up-to-date information from people kind of like the old time days. But, um, if you've noticed, um, everything is starting to go through the roof. Um, it's already been the prices on everything have been going up, yeah. but recently, um, chicken and eggs have just absolutely skyrocketed chicken eggs. Yeah. Uh, chicken hasn't gone too high, comparatively speaking, to what it was in the last year. But um, grocery shopping wise, don't refer to Greg's pricing uh, points because he doesn't grocery shop. So, well, we did. We lat was it or the or last week we went on the stream. Um, I did decide to maybe I would go to the store with you on the, that one. Wow. I'm, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> well, you went to, to a Costco. Store on, oh, that doesn't on a count. Sunday. That is actually 
that's nowhere close to like an Aldi's or a Walmart. Mm-mm. So yeah, that's there's that. not, not, not doing it. But uh, if you've been to the store um, or if not, um, and, and you're the kind of guy that stays home and uh, your wife handles that and takes care of it, then that's awesome. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard, oh my gosh, the prices are going through the roof. Well, what's challenging is when egg prices go through the roof um, during the winter time on the homestead and farm, you start to feel that for sure. Yeah, it's it's making it's making everything feel a little bit more pinched because in the winter, we do a lot more with eggs. Um, and that's when our chickens are either not laying at all or laying very little um, until several months after solstice. So that that becomes challenging. You know, who doesn't want that delicious egg casserole bake or breakfast bake or scrambled eggs and, you know, whatever in the morning on a cold winter morning? It's good to have. What was that for? I don't know. <laughs> Wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> I was talking. That was good. I, I, I was trying to do the one where it sounded all dreamy. You know, this one. Oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So I, 52 I've got million little, chickens were killed due yeah. to the bird flu. So Thomas at Free Range that, uh, Art Farm. Okay. That explains is, that, the that's prices explained. of eggs. Yes. Right. And I, I, have, um, I have promised Susie that because I'm trying to keep my headphones on, that I, I don't have room for my headphones and my tinfoil hat. But uh, a lot of you homesteaders are also fellow uh, conspiracy theorists and we'll, we'll avoid going down that rabbit hole tonight. But, um, you know, the whole, the, 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 the stability of the, the entire industrial food system is not, uh, it's not a news flash that there are a lot of challenges and a lot of things going on and there always has been. But it seems like the, you know, we're, we're in a situation now where, um, these things keep coming up and up and up and up and up. Uh, And so what can we do on the homestead to the ultimate goal? And let's uh, two definitions. I think we'll go ahead and clear up right off the cut is we all want to be self-sufficient. But self-sufficiency is, is one of those pie in the sky dreams that um, to be truly 100% self-sufficient is extremely difficult. And, and I mean, let's say, let's just say in the, in the fact of raising, um, just raising chickens. If, okay, if you can, if you can brood your own eggs, if you can make your own chickens, if you can somehow grow and raise all of your feed and all of your components and where you don't have to leave or, or, or bring inputs in, okay, that is true self-sufficiency. But I think what a lot of us are more focused on is resiliency, homestead resiliency, whether that's with our livestock, whether that's in our bee yards, whether that's in our business, we're looking for ways to be resilient so that we can weather these storms when they come, whether it's literally a storm coming and knocking over 70 or 100 or 200 colonies um, of bees, um, whether it's um, foxes coming and eating all of our chickens, whether it's the food system throwing a wrench in our budget or availability, um, we're always trying to find ways to where we can build homestead resiliency. So there's a difference. So homestead resiliency and homestead self-sufficiency Two different things, yeah. Um, and they are very, very important, which I think is kind of what gets a lot of folks um, into homesteading because there's a lot of just amazing opportunities to not only live life, love life, but get in tune with with a lot of long lost um, arts of of living a simple, beautiful life. Well, and I think it also is, as far as I, the way I look at it is, yes, resiliency is wonderful and self-sufficiency is wonderful. But I also think as a homeschooling mother of seven, that it teaches a lot of responsibility and it's, it, we work that into our education. So our children are learning those skills firsthand that even their grandparents didn't have or don't have. And maybe even a little bit of their great grandparents, um, even though my my grandmother, their great grandmother, lived um, in the middle of the city, she, you know, her mother canned. Uh, they never kept livestock, though, so you know she didn't grow up with chickens in the backyard. So I mean, it's something that it, you can teach your children how to do, and then if they choose to keep that going, then that's great. And if not, then they've just you know learned a responsibility, learned how to take care of something other than themselves. 
that's one of the one of the great things about you know when we pair and couple homesteading and homeschooling and our style of living everything is a teachable moment everything can be a life lesson and so when we can tune and shape our every day to day uh, around that it, it creates incredible opportunities you know for the kids where we've got kids that get up on their own um, and they they run out they they open up the birds they close the birds they gather eggs they take care of chicken bedding and chicken chores and things like that and we're going to get into all that uh, on tonight's live chat but when we talk about why even think about getting into raising your own flock, I mean, how hard can it be? Just a bunch of chickens. They're going to make their own eggs. They're going to be out there doing their own. Nope. There is an awful lot to it. Um, and raising chickens may or may not be for you. So tonight, what we want to do is kind of talk a little bit about um, wh why we we've covered that a little bit. Um, get into kind of some the actual homestead, the realistic uh, expectations, the pros and the cons of raising chickens, but right. also what could you expect? What what kind of opportunities are there? Um, and maybe this is a good fit for you. Um, Susie, you've been raising chickens for. I, I mean, raised chickens as a kid Yeah. Um, for a little while when we lived on a farm. And so I had some experience that you didn't have um, growing up only in the city. Um, but we've been raising chickens for almost 10 years now, 10 or 11 years now, uh, just with our children. Um, so I have some of the very first pictures breaking all HOA rules by <laughs> having chickens in our backyard in the city. So, um, yeah, we've been, I've been raising, I raised chickens as a kid too, though. So I enjoy them. I think they have lots of value outside of the eggs you would get or the meat you may harvest. We, we, we've been keeping it contrary uh, for quite a long time, not in the sense to be intentionally contrarians, but we're the type of folks where um, we know that we're living our life and we want to get, um, we want to live life to its fullest. And that means a lot of the times going against the grain, uh, swimming upstream. Um, and we're the ones that uh, feel like this is for us to do, uh, to teach our kids and to set that example. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, chickens are just, um, a part of the whole entire thing, but you've been raising chickens for your entire life. Um, for the most part, we've been raising chickens um, as a family for um, 10 years. I can remember when we, before we really got out to a bigger piece of land, when we had the land secured before we were coming out here, we ordered our chicks, we ordered our ducks. And uh, oh. we, there's, there's probably pictures out there where we have ducks swimming in our sink. We um, do in, in the, the bathtub. In the bathtub. They put them in the bathtub. We were raising chickens and ducks in our garage in an HOA sub subdivision. Yeah. Um, that was special. We did let the kids down the street in the neighborhood see them though. They thought that was pretty cool. And I think it gave people a glimpse into what might happen later on in our family. So that was pretty cool. Uh, our kids really enjoyed it then. Um, and still do, I mean, probably the chore part, not as much as like, you know, oh, yeah, it's a cute little chicken. But, uh, you know, they they all have their own. They, we get to rotate chores. So not everybody has chicken chores all the time. Right. Yep. So. It all, it, we switch. We, we, we switch the chores out. Yeah. So everything kind of stays fresh and everyone gets a, a turn at that. But every, no matter who it is, everybody loves to hear that little chirpy box of little fuzzy chicks that are just so adorable. Um, and then if little, you bring them home in a box, that's not the only way to do it. But yeah, that, and, we're, and let's let's well, what do you think? What do you say we, we get into this? What raising chickens for eggs? Um, how hard can it be? How hard can it really be? Well, homesteaders are just the type to dig in and uh, just figure it out themselves. A lot of us are hard headed and stubborn. So tonight we just want to share with you kind of um, some hard lessons learned, uh, share with the pros and the cons of our experience. Um, raising chickens and what that may or may not mean for you. So let's cut right to it. Price. Because here in America, we look at price. And it's smart. It's smart to look at the price of things. It's smart to be cognizant of the fact that you're spending your money and where you're spending it and how you're spending it. So why in the world would you buy chickens instead of just buying eggs from the grocery store? Why? What The price, okay. So, but... Is the price really cheaper if you buy them and keep them and raise them? Well, we'd have to get into a conversation about um, how commercial chickens are raised, um, what their feed is, 
what kind of life that they live. I mean, if you are what you eat, um, that goes all the way back to those chickens. You know, a lot of these chickens um, from the eggs at the grocery store, they're raised in confinement barns. Um, they never see daylight. They're, they're fed a very specific feed um, and they do make eggs and the eggs do have nutrition um, and there, it is a, a, a product. Um, but I think if we actually look at the, the nutritional density of an egg, when you compare an egg, um, just like a grocery store, just a grocery egg. store egg with a farm raised egg, they, not only do they look completely different, but they taste completely different. Yeah. So help the, you know, if you're looking at it from price point, yes. Uh, commercially raised eggs are going to be cheaper. Um, if you do more of the free range or organic, I, I don't know how they say that, but anyway, organic egg, um, or let's just say eggs from the farmer's market or a local farmer that you know, those are going to be more expensive. If they're not, then shame on them. They need to be asking the price that it costs to raise those hens and feed them pro pro appropriately. $2 a carton, even when eggs were 99 cents, was too cheap. And um, they should be more expensive. They're putting more work in. They're not on a commercial industrial farm where they're cranking them out and never seeing the light of day, um, they should be more expensive. So if you're asking mm -hmm. your farmer to make them cheaper, shame on you. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I don't want to say misunderstandings or misinformation out there, but you know, if we just go back all the way to a, a lot of things in life have to do with price, the, the economics of food, the economics um, of everything are the one of the driving forces for just about every single market. Right. Within that, we get in, we get into um, variables and such where it's quality and it's it's um, fast, how fast you can get something, um, the quality of it. But when we're talking about grocery store eggs, um, we eat them all the time. If you go run through a McDonald's and get a sandwich uh, for breakfast sandwich, it's going to be on there. Um, if you go to Cracker Barrel or Denny's and get an egg, it's very likely going to be one of those. So are those absolutely terrible for you? Well, that's a conversation for a different day. Um, are they as healthy and are they as tasty um, than an egg from a chicken that you're raising um, free range in the backyard who they're foraging, they're they're going through the grass and the weeds and even the forest floor and, and getting all kinds of goodies and nutrients and macronutrients and vitamins and the essence of the ground that you you actually live on? No, no. I, that's a that's a special thing that I just, just bear for one second. Bear with me here. Okay, our, we live on a homestead here, right? We're surrounded. We, we live on a hillside. It's heavily forested. The farm does have some open areas and a pond and things like that. But I want you to think about if you are if you are living this kind of a life, right? Th your hands in the soil. You are what you eat. You, everything of the trees and the soil and the flower and the bees that not only makes up our quality of life and our purpose, yeah. But the but but the food that we are raising and harvesting from the soil um, is a part of who we are. It's a part of our health. When we can raise animals and especially chickens on the soil that we're living in, those chickens are living in our exact context. The, 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 the sun is rising, the sun is falling, we're seeing the same stars, we're under the same tree canopies, we have the same soil, the same bugs, the same flowers, the same breeze. To me, that is a very beautiful thing. And so when we can raise animals in this context on the same soil that we're working, that's a beautiful thing. And so when we can harvest a product like an egg from a chicken in that system, that is a really cool thing. Um, but we're also getting a, t we're, we're actually getting a taste of the land. We are, we are eating and, and, and uh, we have provision right off the land in the most intimate way possible. And to me, that's beautiful, whether it's a chicken, whether it's a hog or a cow or even our bees, when when their life form and essence has a yield and that yield is important to us and is impacting our way of life and quality of life and health. That's a beautiful thing. Yes. And there I have read I have read studies where um, they're, you know, when they test, you know, commercially grocery store eggs versus like your your homestead eggs on your count, you can keep them on the counter. Yes, I did see somebody post that or comment about that. You can keep, you can't keep grocery store eggs out. You have to keep them refrigerated. But if they come straight from your coop, you keep that bloom on and you can keep them on your countertop. But they do have higher, 
higher A, D, and E and omega-3 fatty acids. And that in and of itself is like extra vitamins for Mm -hmm. free. So instead of buying the, you know, vitamins at the grocery store because you're lacking in those areas, um, you could eat your farm fresh eggs. And let's face it, would you rather have a, I mean, in the comments here, I want you to to uh, comment, drop us a comment, and I want you to, to post a comment and just say, warm butt nugget. If you have literally had a war, an egg that you just pulled from the chickens that is still warm, you especially right. on a cold day. That's so weird to say that. Why do you say butt nuggets? That's so gross. I mean, Don't that, say it like that. That's, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. Versus, It sounds like poop. Yeah, so Grammy Grammy knows, Lisa knows what's up. Yes. So that compared to an egg that you went to Walmart to get. Yeah. That I know. was what harvested from a chicken 30 days ago. Or more. In a life, in an essence, in, in a food system that is completely different. I mean, we are talking about yeah, two different things. Totally. You're right. I mean, the health like uh, health benefits. See, look at all the are, comments yeah. here. See, yeah. everyone knows what's up on the warm butt nuggets. That's just what it is. Yeah. And I tell you what, they keep your hands warm on the way down from the coop. So there's that. That or is at least in that my is case, literally you when know, it's cold out. That, that's farm fresh, you that's know, from the from fresh. the field of the table. I should have brought my oh, I forgot my egg cart, my egg carton that my mom got me a long time ago. Says oh, that's right. What does it say? Butt nuggets for breakfast. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, something. Uh, but, I don't wow. know. Whatever. You're even using the butt nut. No, wow. no, I did not. This mm-hmm, was a label mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yep. Anyway, it's cute. Well, that's so so there's a there's a lot of outside of the the romantical ideas of a homestead and, and raising animals. There is just so many nutritional um, benefits um, to doing that. Now, that doesn't come without expense, though, does it? No, but on the why, we we covered the price. We've covered the health benefits. We you you're covering working towards resi- you know resiliency. Um, the rewards of giving maybe showing your own kids responsibility or yourself you do have to have a schedule opening and closing and keeping you know your your flock um but compared to almost almost any other outside large kind of like you know livestock they're pretty low impact meaning that they don't have there's not a huge amount of risk and or infrastructure having to be built like you would for some other animals you may want to dive into um, when you go. um, Although, you know, that chicken math will get you. So it could be as expensive as buying, you know, that bread cow. We should have put a disclaimer before we even started. (laughs) Warning, like go across a disclaimer. Chicken math. Like just the... (laughs) Okay, warning. Chickens are 100% the gateway gateway drug drug. on the homestead. (laughs) One day... It's just a a, a a couple of chicks from from TSE. The next day, it's goats on the roof. Literally, it's a it's a it's a thing. Yeah, uh, and I know a lot of you know all about that. I don't know that we're getting to a whole lot of goat conversation anymore, but no. I will tell you this: I've only found one type of fencing system that will hold in a goat, and that's a freezer door. <laughs> that's wrong. You shouldn't have said that. Hey, but but. It, now that was funny. See, I know a couple of those buttons, and I'm willing to press them. <laughs> so, what what are some of the we, we we can talk all night and wax philosophically about the the benefits and why folks should think about getting into chickens? But what are some of the realistic risks and cons of raising chickens? What are some things to be aware of? Yeah, so I'm the cuff half empty, so I could think of a thousand things reasons why you shouldn't do it. Um, they're expensive. So you're not just buying a chicken and then all of a sudden you get eggs and it's like, you know, this, you know, Disney movie kind of thing where it's, they're just great and fun to look at. Um, they need infrastructure and you need to keep them safe and fed and watered and, um, you know, we can go into the, yeah, alive, um, (laughs) you know, so uh, so they can be expensive. Um, so if you get them off to a good start, usually they're kind of hands off, um, as far as, you know, all day, every day you have to babysit them or anything. 
um, they are a whole heck of a lot easier to raise from chicks than, let's say, turkeys. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Should we, we were should we so throw dumb. Off that trick? We should just throw that. Throw that no, no, we were so dumb. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. So anyway, don't buy 20 heritage turkeys and then expect them all to live the first year. Um, turkeys are some oh. of the, and I mean this respectfully to all of the God's great creatures, but turkeys no. are some of the most stupidest critters that I've ever had the pleasure. There are a of lot of with. smarter animals out there. I shouldn't have been so mean. I, I, I feel like I was a little too, too mean on the turkeys. They're just no, no intelligence yes. lacking head bobbing i'll drown and die in every die. possible i will die way, with my head in the form. feed i will die with my head in the water i will die because i want to die i'll die because i'm just standing there staring at the wall i will die because i just don't have any will to live um they're if very, you get turkeys special. and you've never raised them raise them with chicken chicks chicks that's a pro tip if you're going to raise turkeys order chicks or get and chicks you'll at the hear same all exact you'll hear time. all the all the I don't do that because they can carry disease. Da, blah, 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 blah. Just keep them healthy. Yeah. Be smart about you know not you know changing out their water and doing all that. But please don't raise them by themselves. They're not smart enough to live. No, but they are. They, they are good at mimicking, and they can mimic dumb, and yes. they can mimic smart. Yeah. So they're all dumb. If you put a pack of dumb together, you're going to get dumb. Just dumb dumbs. But if you put some chicks in there, yeah, the chicks go right to town and and eat and drink on their own, no problem. The turkey poults will see that. And then go to town, and next thing you know, it was a whole different. And then you won't waste two hundred dollars on turkeys that oh you never got gosh. to harvest and eat. So there's that. I sort of forgot. I'm about not. That. I'm not negative at all. I'm not like bitter at all about mm, that. Not, not, not at all. Not bitter at all on the turkeys. I, I learned my lesson. I'll never do that again. So, um, so expensive. You know, uh, yes, eggs are expensive at the grocery store. Don't buy them at the grocery store. Support a farmer right. if you don't want to get chickens. But if you do want to get chickens, know that a coop doesn't build itself. It doesn't just magically appear because right. you buy chicks from Rural King or Tractor Supply. You need a coop. You need waterers. You need feeders. And you need feed, which is not cheap. Even the cheapest non-not non GMO food is expensive. The GM, you know, non-GMO organic, whatever you're going to use food is very expensive. 20 to $30 a bag where we are. And I'm sure it's more expensive. Um, in our, you know, that's just in our local area. So if, depending on where you live, it could be way more than that. Um, so that expense, expense, they're not cheap. Um, and they do need some, you know, if feeders break or whatever, you know, those startup fees are, will get you. But that will that will with any animal. You don't just go buy a rabbit right. and not have a hutch or whatever. So I can think of expense. There's a lot of expenses and there's there's a, a, a little bit of a learning curve. But when you go all the way back to, let's say you, um, the easiest way to raise more chicks is once you have experience um, and you have some hens that go broody yeah. and they lay eggs and they sit on them and they raise their own. Those are hands down the best. Because they don't, they don't need you. You right. just check in a little bit, make sure everyone's getting in and out of the coop okay, if they've got food and water. But Mama Hen takes care of all the babies. The babies grow up, and they keep doing that thing over. It's like when we were breeding, you know, always breeding um, the best queens, and we're always moving those genetics forward. The same thing happens naturally, um, even with the chicken flock. Because yeah, the, the, and you can get an incubator and do the same thing sure with can. farm fresh eggs. If you have a friend that has chickens and you would like to start with incubated eggs, you know, there's plenty of YouTube university videos on how to start those things and do those things to save some money because chicks in and of themselves buying them from a mail order and or, you know, your local feed supply stores there, they can be pricey. Um, but, you know, just know that buying chicks and then thinking that all of a sudden you're going to have cheap eggs. It's just not how For it's going to work. For folks who haven't ordered chicks yet um, and they haven't had that experience of setting up a brooder, um, why don't you run folks through what that looks like? Um, if you're going through the catalogs or the online um, websites and ordering chicks, what does that um, look like? What can they expect? And then how do folks get those chicks off to a good start? Well, if you're going to go like mail order route, um, just know that A, you can't just buy like one of each. 
Um, and they usually have a minimum. So some places have a minimum of let's say 20, they won't ship less than 20. Um, your local farm stores usually have like a minimum of six if you're going to go in and buy them. But um, mail order, you're going to need to buy a higher volume. They also get cheaper as you buy more. Um, and just know that you have to account for some loss. Um, like with any other thing, you might lose some in the first days or weeks of having them. Um, as far as looking at your varieties and su such, you know, we, we've done all kinds of varieties and I, they all are great. Um, if you're going for volume, you know, there are chickens that lay way more eggs than others. So you do want to look at that when you're flipping through the, those catalogs and or online. Um, brown versus white never found a difference. It, it's just preference. Uh, we have Easter eggers that are blue and green and they're beautiful. There are chicks that lay our chickens that will end up laying pinkish eggs, brown eggs, white eggs, you, you name it. Um, so get what you like, get what you want to look at, get what you want to see every day. Or ask another homesteader, you know, what have you had, you know, good luck with, have there been, you know, there, I don't know that we've had necessarily bad luck with any breed of chicken, but I think some of them are maybe a little bit better layers. Some of them maybe are a little bit better as far as being broody and all taking those, care of chicks. All those analytics are there on the websites and stuff. They'll say number of eggs, expect you know, a, approximate number of eggs, approximate, you know, are they more tendent to be broody versus never laying on an egg? If you don't, if you're not looking for that, don't worry about it. And, um, and so that, that all, all those things are usually on the websites. They're really good about that. The characteristics. Um, and yeah. Those kind yeah. Of things. Yeah. What the chicks look like versus how they grow up to look when they're older. Um, but sometimes when you order chicks on a catalog or, um, through a, a catalog or that's a catalog twice online, a catalog, um, or even if you go into your TSC or rural King or local feed store to get chicks. Um, a lot of times you're going to be unpleasantly surprised that you might have half and half that might be mixed. You might have half end up being roosters and half being hens. And if this is your first time learning about chickens and eggs, um, we're going to, um, we don't probably need to have the birds and the bees talk. You see what I did there? That was funny. I thought that was funnier. That was, <laughs> well, so of course uh, the roosters, um, they just, they're there to, fertilize the eggs um, and um, the, the hens, the, the girl roosters are there laying the eggs. Oh, uh, no, there's not girl roosters. So there you go. He's wrong. Did I say it's girl roosters? Yes, you did. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If a chicken lays an egg on the ground floor of the barn and it hatches, what is it? A chicken? Okay. If a chicken... Where are you uh, going with if, this? if a hen lays an egg on the second floor of the barn and it hatches, what is it? A chicken? If a rooster lays an egg on the roof of the barn and, and sits on it and it hatches, what is it? A rooster doesn't lay an egg. Ah, daggone. It was so close. I knew you were going to try to get me on that. That's why so, I was listening really hard. So sometimes you end up getting uh, a bunch of, of extra roosters. And what do you do with them? Well, they're not laying any eggs. Um, and you only need, we, we really only need to have one to two roosters for every 15 it, hens or so. Just watch because I think mostly you need to think about if they're going to free range, you need them to, for protection. Roosters are good at protecting. Some of them are not. Right. And so if you do not have protective roosters for your hens, get rid of them. You're feeding them for nothing. Yep. Um, fertilized eggs. Uh, a rooster only has to fertilize the hen every 30 days. So um, there's that. And if you're never going to incubate your eggs or let your chickens go broody, you don't need a rooster at all. They still lay eggs without a rooster. Now we learned, we did, if you are going to pick up chicks at the local feed store, yeah. do you want to uh, tell folks your super secret? Uh, I don't know if it's a super secret. So I, I hate to share that. And then everybody be like, wah, wah. No, Susan, you're so wrong. It, it may work. It may not. I don't know. We, it, I'm not going to tell the secret because I don't know if it really works. That, that's, that doesn't seem very nice. Well, I don't think it's real. I mean, like it's not proven a hundred percent. Let's or just anything. say one of the, I don't want to let anybody how about down. Wives tales? How about call it a wife's tale and throw it out there? Okay. So supposedly the old wife's tale is if you spread out the chicken's wing, stay with me here. 
if you spread out the chicken's wing, and these are on chicks, you will look and the very first, like, like I'm trying to, your microphone's in the way. Discombobulated there you here. go. So let's say the wings are, you know, they kind of go like down in a nice pattern of like the straightness. Feathers. The feathers go down. The ones that are um, roosters, is that right? Mm -hmm. The roosters have the ones that stick out way further at the the very tip of closest to their head. Okay. So their, their feathers are going to be real, real jagged out front and then taper off. But the hens have a real nice More uniform. contoured uniform line. So that's supposedly the trick. You pull their you pull their wing out and look at that and see if there's all kinds of jagged. Then um, you just put that little thing back and go for the next one. We, I, well, that's how we sex the chickens when we would, when we would buy them. And I I want to say it's probably like ninety. It's worked like ninety percent of the time. Well, here's the only problem. What? We did that last year, and then I had some predation, and I really didn't end up getting um, a, a lot of eggs from those chickens that we did that with. So I can't say because a fox ate all my hens. So well, let's get into some of the cons and, and some of the <laughs> risks. Um, you, of course, you have, you have the initial expense, of course, buying the chicks and the chick starter and the feed. You know, you're going to have to have watering systems. Um, as the season, if you're starting with chicks, you need a brooder too. As the season progresses, we'll talk more about that. What that kind of looks like. We've got a lot of um, really neat homestead hacks, um, ways that we um, can gravity feed, have fresh uh, water at all times, feed, um, and it creates a less um, a less hands on um, all the time for those little things, and it helps build a little bit more time buffer and resilience um, with the critters, but. You know, you're going to, you get them, you bring them home or they, or they get shipped to you. First thing you have to do is you have to get them into a brooder. You want to talk to them a little bit about what a brooder is and kind of what you, uh, one of your favorite brooder setups is. Well, we've had all kinds. And when we, when we were in the city, we didn't have any kind of uh, trough uh, waterers sitting around like we do now. So we were using large, extra large totes like you would move with or store your Christmas Big tree plastic in. tubs. Yeah. And um, we used those. Um, we did I put them in our house, which uh, please don't do that. If you're going to if you're going to raise chicks, it was gross. It was dander and dust everywhere from the bedding. It was chickens are messy. Oh, they're so messy. And um, they grow from chick to not chick, even though they're still a chick. They go from chick, oh, so cute. They're peep, 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 you know, all through the night. And then all of a sudden they're wanting to jump out of the box and they're running around your house pooping and the bedding starts to smell like every single day. And then every half of the, you know, within half of the day, they smell lots of bedding. So now what we do, we don't have a, like a heated garage or, you know, if you have a garage outside, but attached to your house or something, this might work in that a little better than what we have, but we don't have anything like that. So we put a, a large, what would you say that is? How many gallons? Oh, probably da, 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 maybe 100. Yeah. We, 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 we have gallons? a couple different sizes, but um, we use uh, big, big water troughs yes. um, that you see at the feed store, the big galvanized tubs yeah it depends on Pro how many i think chicks the one that you, you like the most is probably about 150 gallon i want to say so so anyway we use that and that that is what we use from the day one chick to feathered out and it's a really nice setup because we have just like this like framed graded top that we put on it so it can control like airflow they get enough air um but we actually can put a piece of um what is that plastic thing? Well, we have the we have the galvanized big stock tank. Yes. And then um, we've got red heat lamps to keep their temperature at 95 degrees. Yeah. And then we can even do that in the dead of winter when it's really, really cold. Yes. And we'll put um, we'll kind of close the top off a little bit. It's like a corrugated. Well, no, it's like a it's a perforated um, plexiglass. Plexi OK, so that holds the heat in. So if you're having to do this in the winter, which I highly suggest not to raise chicks in the winter. Um, yeah, it's not ideal. <laughs> it's not ideal. We have done it in the past because um, Susan's impatient. But if you're not ready to put your plants, transplants in the ground, you probably shouldn't have chicks 
trying to get on it's the just, ground. It's either. a little more. It's a little riskier. Something at least happens. in Ohio. This is my context. So do what you want. It's your rodeo. That's true. But it's, it is. That's what we do in Ohio. For yeah. Sure. The, in Ohio, it's not ideal that you have a higher loss. Um, you're having to heat them a lot more, and the red lamps are not cheap to heat. I mean, it's like and they can be health. They, they can be a uh, fire fire hazard. hazard. Too. So yeah, a lot of people burn down their barns with. Um, Red lamps, uh, heat there lamps. There are some catalytic ones and some some ceramic ones and ones that are, um, I, I they say are as if, uh, effective but don't have the the fire risk. So you can maybe um, look into that. But those birds need to have um, hot, hot, 95 degrees like underneath their mom's butt. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. they're gonna hide underneath mom's their mom's butt, butt, butt. And if it's getting cool at night or cold or freezing, they will freeze until, they, until they they feather out. And then once they start to feather out, they can. But that's it's, that can be four weeks. to five weeks right. of keeping a heat lamp yep. inside of this tank um, with bedding, which is pine, so it's flammable. Right. Um, you need to keep constant water and constant feed, and uh, they can't do without water. They can do without feed overnight, so you don't have to wake up like an infant and feed them at night. But um, gotta have water. Yeah, that's a constant Clean every water. single day. Um, so that those are the like the beginning, uh, the beginnings of what you're going to get. Even even if you get them from the post office, um, you get them shipped to you and you're picking them up from the post office. Which, the, so they're not going to bring them to your doorstep usually. Right. So you have to go and the, pick them up from the post the office. The biggest things to look forward to about raising chicks is poop. <laughs> everywhere. Well, I look forward to it poop because everywhere. it's great for Chicken the poop. compost pile. It's fantastic fertilizer. It's if great they to put poop in the compost in the pile. bedding and go from the bedding right. to the but garden. But they will find ways to poop in the water and no. poop in the, not so much in the feed, but they whatever they'll poop in anything. They just absolutely everything. And yeah. bird grease is just some of the foulest thing. It's not not quite as bad there? as turkey, but it's bad and it's gross. And you know, I've had chickens on my front doorstep <sighs> looking in my windows. Especially turkeys are really obnoxious for that. You know, I just want to make sure I say that again, that, you know, chicken poop is one of the most foul things. Oh, you did get the pun in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's that. Okay. So you, you, you buy the chickens, you figure out what types and varieties you like. Hopefully yep. you don't get a bunch of roosters. Yeah. You get them started off um, into a brooder where the temperature is warm and they have fresh food and water all the time. Yep. And then they poop and they poop and they grow and they get big and they poop a lot more. Yeah. And they keep growing and they poop and they just. And then when they're fully feathered out, you can get them, you can transition them from this brooder situation where it's nice and warm and slowly you transition that heat lamp away and they're fully feathered and you get to put them in their big girl coop. And that is something that is an e another expense. Um, it's going to probably have a different water situation than you started with when they're chicks. So you're going to have probably that transition waterer where you have a different mm -hmm. size. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes not. Um, but we've had a lot of different types of coops um, over the years. I think I've got my favorites and I bet you have yours too. Um, Coops are can be as expensive as you want to spend. I mean, thousands of, do of dollars on coops to hold six birds. You can totally spend that kind they of money. They can have a McMansion. They can. Oh, that's good. McMansion. I like hey, that. Hey, I'm here all day. There, there can be the McMansion. Uh, it can be a corner of a garage. It could be a doghouse, a cat. There could be a, a ton of different things. But then some of the main components to consider um, on a coop, whether you're buying a coop or you're building a coop, is birds like to roost, like to get up off of the ground um, is one of the big things. It just it gives them a place to feel secure at nighttime. They'll get up on their roost um, and they'll just uh, hang out, cruise, sleep, rest up uh, to kind of do their thing. And um, they like to get up as high as they can. Um, they, they just they love to do that. That's one thing to keep in mind when you're building a Cooper Bind one is make sure there's plenty of roost bars or add some um, because that's something that they really do uh, prefer, it seems. What that and they're totally buildable. Like you can do your own. Oh, we've I, I think we'll talk about that. We've we've built a lot of very unique um, types of coops that I think you are don't more have of my to, favorite. I feel like Tractor Supply sells you the ones that they get a commission on or something because I've heard them actually. I've actually heard them talking. They look so cute. I just sold that four hundred and fifty dollar yeah, one, and I'm they like, they look so cute, what? and they've got all the windows, <laughs> and they've got all this that. What in the but world? They're made. They're made out of like Chineseium and who knows what, and they they fall apart and they rot and they're. 
they weigh about three pounds and the wind blows them over and they're just, yeah. they're problematic, but it gets people um, into the, into raising chickens sometimes. So I think there is some value to it. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. But um, one of the, I think my favorite coop was we took a, a Harbor freight trailer. It was a, um, a six foot wide by eight foot trailer. It wasn't worth a darn for a trailer. It was no longer it roadworthy. It was yeah. In, yeah. And so what I did is I just, I just built a, um, a, a single slope <laughs> roof structure. She converted her kid's old play playhouse into it. Awesome. You, that's Good it. job, Michelle. You yes. can just, you can totally do it uh, any which way you want. We took that old trailer and we uh, built the coop up and um, that way we could actually move our chickens coop throughout the homestead. Um, so they weren't wearing out a, the same piece of ground over and over and over again. We could move it around. They could fertilize things, have a little bit uh, more variety to kind of eat. Um, and so our most of our style of, of um, chickens, for the most part, is something that we call day range, where they are in a secure night um, coop. Yeah. And in the mornings, we open them up and they free range the property. Yeah. And that night, they're trained to go back into their coop. We close them up and we lock them. And everything's great. Unless... Someone forgets to close them up at night. And then it is just a four-star buffet for every raccoon um, or fox or you name it. Yeah. Um, skunks and possums will get in there and try to rob eggs too. Um, so there, there's always um, that kind of a, of an issue. But, yeah, predation is but hard on. when they're out able to free range, and I, I like that. But it, de it definitely comes with a great risk. Yeah. Um, if you've got a lot of open pasture and open field and things where – they're more prone um, and vulnerable to aerial attacks. They can get um, just absolutely destroyed by yeah. hawks um, quickly. Swooped up. There's totally, and that and that 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 that's a real problem. That can be a real threat too. Um, a lot of folks will mitigate that different ways with maybe livestock guardian dogs or fake owls or this or that or the other. There's lots of ways to do it, but it, it's definitely a risk. I saw a really funny... Okay, so I'm probably on some chicken stuff. I don't know on, on socials. And um, I saw a really fun one where somebody actually put... You know those like waving um, things that you have like the air going through? Oh, like at the haircut places? Yeah. They had one of those in their chicken yard to keep like aerial attacks down. Wow. I thought that's really cool. And the chickens didn't seem to care at all. Mm. So I thought, wow, if you really have a problem with that, which mom and Jeff do, mm -hmm. um, that would be a cool way to keep your aerial attacks at, you know, at bay. But then of course we have more of the ground roaming. We had a fox last year clean us out. Um, we mm. were left out of like the 36 we had. There was like 12 left. Which remember that, stunk. Do you remember that year where we lost, um, gosh, I don't even know how many, was that? Ten thousand dollars in meat birds, like two hundred. We had uh, two hundred two hundred meat birds that were beautiful, and 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 we raised them. Um, if if you're new to chickens, I want you to look up something called um, the Plamondon hut. Uh, it's or, or the Plamondon chicken tractor, and in essence, it's you're you're taking you're you're building a frame. Let's say a two by six treated frame that's uh, eight seven feet wide by um, eight or twelve feet long. You build that frame, that picture frame, and then you take um, cattle panels like you use on the farm and you bend them over and then you use, you use big um, fence staples and you staple that thing down and then you can cover that with uh, uh, chicken wire. Mm -hmm. you, can put a, you can put doors on the front and the back and then you can put either a tarp or um, some visqueen, some plastic on top. And what you have is, a, ver a for the most part, a lightweight mobile chicken um, hut that you can either raise meat birds in or you can raise your um, your layers in and build some nesting boxes on the inside. I like those because you can build something like that for 150 bucks or less and you can move it around. And we have done we have done everything from using um, those style hoop huts for uh, greenhouses um, as chicken brooders, as uh, chicken tractors for raising um, meat birds. Um, we've used them for hog huts in the wintertime to stay warm. So they're a, a fantastic, uh, multi-purpose kind of a thing that you can get a lot of use out of for not a lot of money. And so the, I like those ones are probably, um, probably Other my than favorite. being a little heavy for they like heavy. me, right. um, I'm only five, three. Yep. Um, and so it, the, they have to be built when you're, when you're bending those cattle panels, you've got to put enough wood underneath to keep them suspended right. and in, in 
in a spot. So it can get a little heavy in that aspect. But if you have something to move them with, you know, boys or a quad or, you know, something like that, then those work out really well. Um, for there's there's so many coop. different, there's, oh, see, this is fun because now we get into that thing where it's like, there's always more than one way to pluck the chicken. See what I did there? Oh, are you there, done with an, those tonight? An actual chicken pun that fits. You can make you can make these coops and brooders and whatever. The I'm most sure thing is understanding Pinterest why and, these things yeah. work yeah, like, and what what they actually need. That you can kind well, of you know, and also tune what your that. what what is your what is your context? Do you do you have a lot of what you would think you might have predation? You need to keep them you know secure, safe. Mm-hmm. You are bringing them in. You need to make sure you're taking care of them to the best of your ability. So, you know, of course, I couldn't have predicted a fox would smell chicken meals for a month and eat all my, it will, they, it usually, you know, they usually, the predators know, it's, they know when you're gone for two days because I, it's like, it's like the normal sounds they hear aren't there. All the smells they want are, we, fox we, aren't afraid of us though. We, they're, well, yeah. they're not. We had, we had 200 meat birds um, and they were, they were heritage breed birds um, each bird would have sold for right around probably 20 to $22 a piece. Um, and we'd left for two days. Um, and we had them in their, in their, their day range, um, scenario. We had electrified poultry netting as a perimeter. Yeah. The, everything was hot and ready to go. We had, they had plenty of food it, 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 under every other time. They were totally, totally fine. Not, not a single issue. Well, we got back and, and so. we got back and they were all dead. And I mean, oh no, there was one. Oh, there was one survivor. There was one that was living up in a tree. Yeah. Um, that lived. But when you walk up to go check up on your birds after being gone for two days, and it looks like a battlefield, and there's nothing but just dead birds as far as you can see, missing heads, bites out of them, you name it. Well, we had uh, some game cameras up, and we had cats. We had possums, we had raccoons, we had coyotes, we had fox. Everybody ate well at Nature's Image Farm um, except us. But we learned a lot because um, so that's just part of this learning experience. You, sometimes you don't know what's out there, how bad it can get until they have an opportunity to do it. So if you can avoid learning those lessons, yeah. just be sure that your birds are in a situation where you can lock them in, you can clo- keep them safe um, at nighttime. And if you live in an area where you do have hawks or bird, a lot of bird pressure, you know, maybe day range isn't for you. Maybe you do something like a coop in a run where you have a coop that you can get in and out of. You can feed them, water them, keep them clean. Um, and they have a run. They can go out and do their chicken, express their full chickenness of the chicken <laughs> that way. Yeah. And and I, I like that because there's, you know, it's, it's kind of the, it's a, it's a happy compromise, I think, between those different things. Yeah. And I think you can, even if you have a coop and a run and you want to let them have a little bit more yard space, you could do some electric netting and, uh, you know, give them a little bit more than that. Um, that's what my mom and her mom and Jeff do is, you know, they have that coop and the run, Mm -hmm. you know, with it's not, it's beautiful, but then they, add on to that um so that they that their birds can be moved a little bit more um through their yard and and take care of that too because they they'll eat through eat through some stuff that you you'd like to get rid of so as much as you love those chickens um and want to take advantage of the eggs or maybe the meat well guess what so does everything else out there so you have to protect them uh you were you might have you know plenty of nights where you might be running out there with a shotgun or a 22 to yeah, Take DC's care of whatever West Beast, feeding is. the neighborhood. Yes, feeding, it is a buffet. You know, and that's a that's a tricky thing as we we want to pretend that we are all for the balance um, and the cycle of life until um, it takes too much from you, and then it's it's a it hits the pocketbook, and then you, you things get real, and you go, oh, let me let yeah. me check myself here. But it's kind of a good excuse to get a red or a green uh, varmint light for your rifle and and go out there and, and do what needs to get done. So I guess there's that. So that's that's one of the risks is predators. predators. The other the other risk, which I, you know, it's it's valid. Um, it happens. We have been very fortunate in the way that we raise our birds because they have so many so much area to range yeah. and get away from each other. We haven't had disease issues, um, but some folks do get into parasites and intestinal 
issues um, and mites and things like that. We don't have a lot of advice to give you um, for that other than we make sure our water is always clean. Um, and now, every now and again, we'll put apple cider vinegar in the water just to help with their with their gut biome and digestion. Um, but give them them this. It's, it's a lot of it is is can be cleanliness. It can also be paired with cleanliness and hot temperatures. Um, folks that raise chickens in hotter climates have things to deal with that maybe we don't so much um, up here in, uh, in north where we're at. Yeah, and I think like for for us, how we deal with um, the potential of like mites or anything like that is in the bedding at least um, is we use de. Um, Right? Is that what we use? Diatomaceous earth. Yeah, we sure do. We put that in the bedding to help yeah, with, mite, yeah, yeah, yeah. with mites. And then um, yeah. Yeah, we also have it and use it um, I was, I to, was for bees to make murder sauce. Yeah, I know. I was thinking because the one I use is gray. Right. We have we have two different types of DE that we have. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is the one I use for the chickens. And right. I was getting, I was confusing myself. Ugh, it's not hard to do. Um. Anyway, so... Yeah, we put that in with our pine shavings, and I do like the larger pine flakes because I feel like they absorb more. I don't like the roll, the roll, um, fine, fine ones. They Oof. make such a mess. It um, does make a mess. They, it's I just I like the flakes. Now everybody's gonna have their preference, yep. but for us and the what we do, and it breaks down a little slower when I put it in our compost piles and stuff. I usually use it as like the base to if I'm gonna start a bed. It's like the very bottom before I add more layers deep, and layers. Deep layer litter space. method is, is something if you do it, it's uh, in the For winter, winter time. in the winter time is great um, because you can just keep adding fresh um, bedding on top of the spent bedding um, until you get into about the spring of the year and you do a complete coop clean, clean out. out and then all of that can then go to the compost pile and our um, nesting boxes or, or some folks will do it um, at fall time. Yep, and do a clean out, make sure everything's nice and clean. That goes into the compost to sit. And to do its magic throughout the winter time, and then they'll start fresh again. And just so fall and spring are nice times to get in there, clean up the coops, um, or clean up any areas. Any uh, we usually do litter. three times mm -hmm. a season: spring, fall, spring, summer, and fall. Yep. Um, by summer, we're cleaning it out pretty good, uh, just because we always get rain. Like you'll get that coop all clean and then we just used old recycled tin on the top of the coop that Greg built way back. Probably needs an overhaul. But um, yeah. that that one used yeah. old recycled tin and it was rusty and old when we put it on uh, eight, that thing nine was, years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was eight because I was pregnant with the twins watching you build it. Yep. Um, and so... I think it's got some pinholes in that thing, and well, it we probably actually, gets there was, some. Well, we we found some treasure piles here on the farm. We found some um, metal roofing that was probably from the '40s. That I don't know. was had, had yeah had a couple of rust. It was you know some pinholes of rust. In it there, was but, like oh, it's good but enough. But we built we literally built this chicken coop for no, for literally yeah, I mean almost nothing. It almost was scraps nothing. of wood. Yeah, I had I had some rough cut lumber that we were building some projects with. That's all. In, that's all I really had in it. Mm -hmm. I had more in screws yep. and nails and brackets and things like that than we did so, anything else. Yep. And it's, but that's it's the homestead its, way. Yeah, you know? that's we made it for nothing and that was fine. Um, it will probably need overhauled. But yeah, that's it's done its job. So it doesn't owe us anything. No. So those are some of the some of the risks of disease, uh, predators. One thing to consider with chickens is that chickens molt and they can molt twice a year. And so you're going to have a period of time where there's not going to be any eggs. And um, it won't be a long period, but when they're refeathering, you know, like when your dog is shedding everywhere because, you know, it's that season, spring, fall, winter, summer, whatever, um, chickens do the same thing and it's stressful. It is just a stressful time for them and they will stop laying um, for a period of time. Hopefully you have them so that they're not all the same age mm -hmm. um, as you as you create cycles of getting new layers um, because of either predation or just their aging, you know, chickens can lay eggs for five to 10 years. If you don't have any extra inputs, forcing them to lay consistently there, you know, during their laying cycle. Can they really lay that long? Yes. They, well, they can five, at least five years. I know mom has some that lay that long. I would never keep if a you, chicken that long, but we let our she has, our chickens rest in the winter time. We yeah. don't, we don't, we don't push them. You certainly can. You can, you know, chickens only have a certain amount of eggs, it seems. Um, and when you, if you've ever butchered an old hen 
uh, yeah. it was actually really cool if, when you butcher a hen. It was a nice science experiment for the you kids. you see all the the leftover or the, all the the little undeveloped tiny 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 little orange eggs and they they run through that oviduct yep. from it's teeny really, tiny it's pretty cool all to see that. the way so to they the have, full egg i think they do have a have a um a, a specific number of eggs in their lifetime they're born with yes and then if you push them to the winter you know you're just going to get shorter lifetime out of the chicken or out of, out of the hen but you're going to maybe have more of those eggs and some of the ways that folks do that is they'll make sure that they keep the coops maybe a little bit warmer. But the main thing is light. It's just like um, for all our beekeeping friends out there, just like our queen bees slow down uh, and do very little through the wintertime until yep. the until solstice and it starts to slowly get more daylights per hour. Yep. Um, daylights per hour? Hours of daylight per day? <laughs> Whew, I'm more out today. Um, same thing with the chickens. They sense that, they know that, and they start ramping back up just like just like the queen bees do. Yep. Um, so you can trick, um, I don't know if trick's the right word. You can, you can. Um, uh, yeah, they can. It's, it's kind of like the blue light in the winter. If you, yeah. if you deal with the seasonal uh, from lacking of sunlight, it, chickens lack sun, you know, they're, they're dealing with the same thing in the winter and they, they will not lay eggs in the winter when, when there's lack of sunlight, when you're getting less yeah. than 12 hours, they need more than 12 hours of sunlight to lay. And that's okay. Cause it gives them a break. Mm -hmm. um, it allows that spring molt to be a little less stressful on them because they're, they're kind of taking that winter break. And then as soon as a uh, winter solstice, um, is over and we start to the pick up the daylight hours as we start to add those minutes, you'll start seeing them pick back up and lay those eggs again. Um, and so we allow them that break and I, I do a couple of different preservation methods to ensure that we have some sort of eggs. Now this year, not so much, but, um, the average <laughs> hen will lay about 530 eggs throughout her lifetime. I, I, it seems like after about three years, they really just become nearly years. freeloaders. Yeah. And, and then, it just depends. I mean, you just have, man, you're just feeding manure makers, which isn't a bad thing. But um, we, we usually have a cleanup party where when we're uh, butchering our meat birds, we'll all the old hens and extra roosters will kind of do all that at once. And that's just a way to keep everything. Um, for, we can talk a lot about um, some of the ins and the outs. Um, but just getting started raising chickens, I think we fit a lot of the the big things. You're either going to order them from a catalog, uh, a website, or you're going to go to your local feed store to buy them. You're going to bring them home. You're going to get them into a brooder where you're going to keep them warm, 95 degrees or so, until they start to feather out. Yeah. Once they feather out, you get them into their coop um, of whatever type you build or buy, yep. where, they, where they need somewhere to roost. You got to have fresh food and water protect them um, from predators, keep everything healthy and happy and clean and have less issues with um, disease and, and, and things like that. Uh, keep them uh, safe and closed up at nighttime. That'll help uh, keep the, the predators um, at bay, knowing that when you see birds that look bald, like their backs look bald, they're missing all their feathers. Yeah, they get ugly. They get ugly during molt. That, during those times of molting, they're they're freshening up those feathers or freshening um, this themselves up and so they're you're, they're not going to be laying eggs um during those time periods in the winter time um they're going to slow down and very, lay very very um little except if you um it takes chick it, it takes chickens up to they, they until they mature at around five months before they start laying eggs so you go through all this um this effort to get chicks started off to a good start but it takes not until they're about five months old do they actually start laying eggs. So one of the fun things to do is to time that to where the chickens are just coming into laying in like October. So yeah, in our spring chickens, we always usually try to raise a, a spring and a fall batch of laying hens. Yeah. I try to time it to where I'm doing it when I'm doing meat birds because it's just easier to have them all at once as far as the chicks go. I don't have a bunch of stuff on my front porch all year long. <laughs> yeah, not not, um, not right now at least. But but, but that's um that's nice to to time that like that. But just know that if you're getting birds, chicks in the spring, you're not going to have eggs until fall or almost winter, and then they're going to go through that lack of light time. So yeah. maybe they won't lay a ton, even though they're supposed to be laying. They're not going to lay a ton in the winter, but 
they will pick back up hot and heavy and in a hurry yep. to get those eggs out of there and get started for you as soon as they get the sunlight back again. So those are just some some of the some kind of the Somebody intro. Asked, oh, Steve said, do we water glass? Yes, I do water glass. What in the eggs. world is water glassing? It's just a preservation method so that we can keep eggs. I usually use them for cooking, like things that you're not like scrambled so there's, eggs. There's also ways that you can preserve eggs outside of hard boiling, um, freezing, freezing. Yep. You can freeze eggs. You can, if you have a, um, oh, what's that thing called? Um, what's that thing called? I don't know what this very expensive thing uh, is that you want to on the homestead. Yeah. Definitely not a freeze dryer. Yeah. So if you freeze dry your eggs, I've heard that I've heard, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it, but I've heard that if you freeze dry mm. eggs, they come out like fresh, like scrambled eggs, but I wouldn't know what, mm. how that goes. So well, maybe we can ask Santa Claus next year. <laughs> <laughs> so chickens. Yes. Can, can you do it? You 100% can. I, I think what's great about raising uh, a flock of chickens is no matter how big your backyard is, you can do it. Um, and you can do it in a way to where it is you're finding it's it's bringing so much joy and happiness to your life. It's also bringing health and nutrition. It's teaching kids responsibility. Yes. Um, it's it's forming some of these life lessons really early on. You know, it doesn't go without risks. There is um, some very minimal risk with it, but a lot of folks can do a really good job at it. But just know that chickens are 100% a gateway drug to everything else, possibly including, but not limited to goats and just do yourself a favor you gotta really love goats to get into that I and mean, it's totally goats fine are, but 4-h but i mean they're, they're fun and for they're, 4-h and they can be like having a pet dog and they're they can it be can really be. great they can follow you around just it's like a just dog the thing about the, my trouble with goats people I, have pet pigs too i'm yeah i'm not saying i'm a control freak but most farmers and homesteaders their absolute number one fear is those critters getting on the road or being on the wrong side of the fence. And when it comes to goats, if you can throw a bucket of water through the fence, it won't hold a goat. Yeah. Goats are a different, different ball. I love, I, I, I actually, the goats, we, that's a story for another day, but we ran a multi-species, multi-species grazing um, kind of a situation where we had the cows and the goats and the chickens and the, and the lambs together. And it was a hot mess. It was cool. And it did the land a lot of good. But uh, boy, those goats were just something. We'll just say the goats were really, really special. Well, before we cut loose tonight, hold on, we got it. Hold on, we got it. Yes, I just wanted to. I we do. We've done both drop time. We've done a free choice feeding, and we dish it out daily. It depends on the season. During really, really wet seasons, that feed will actually let's see, let's ferment. Put the question up there. Yeah, the feed will actually ferment. So, we, so the we don't question do is, do you all feed uh, free choice or dish it out daily? Yeah, we've done both. And it just depends on the season. If we're in a really wet season, our our uh, our feeder actually will let it ferment and get all nasty. So we don't we don't use it depending on the season. Yep. We have some honey shout outs. We, uh, oh, yes. we, we did the we did some honey Let's shout outs on the last one. Let's not forget to talk about Craig. Um, he, he did a if you look at his channel. You can uh, see Craig uh, Midget did the, he actually put an egg. Oh, I'm losing all my words tonight. And I wasn't the one working outside. Anyway, check out Spring Haven Homestead. And he has some really cool ideas for um, brooding boxes for his hens to lay eggs in. Cool. It was really cool. We uh, had some honey shout outs last week. And we Found totally another had an entire bucket <laughs> of honey from the Hive Life Conference that folks gave us that we just now found. And so we want to make sure that we shout um, those folks out too. Um, we've got uh, the Lindsay Homestead, Jeremy Lindsay um, from uh, Dandridge, Tennessee. Look at this beautiful, it's it's what's called white honey, clear honey. Look at that. It's very, very light in color. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, so taste, tasting that one. So Jeremy Lindsay, thanks, buddy. That one looks great. We've got uh, Woodstock Honey from Rushville, Illinois. Of Crazy AZ's Honey, Huddletown, Virginia. That's neat. Look at that. I like that one. That's cool. And then uh, we've got uh, Sourwood Branch Bee Farm. Uh, 
in, let's see, I'm slow to read, Sourwood Brands, uh, Valentine's, Virginia. That's a nice bottle. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Mm-hmm. And then uh, we've, we've got um, Tootsie's Backyard Bees, Raw Honey, Pinson, Alabama. That's a neat label. I like that. So I want to make sure we got our honey shout outs out. Yes. Um, we were just talking um, at the shop today um, that we're getting everything framed out for. One of the things that we're going to make sure we do is have just a really, really fantastic um, honey display. So we can make sure that all the folks who send us honey, they can go right up on display. Um, so anyone who comes and visits, they can come see um, all the honey from across the country. I think that's a really, uh, really cool thing. But um we could spend all night talking about uh, chickens and everything else, but we would just kind of wanted to crack the surface a little bit on uh, raising chickens for eggs. I think we've covered, um, you know, all, all the points that I think make sense for us. Um, the last thing I think that I, I want to ask you is what are your favorite chicken breeds? Oh, well, I, as a kid, I always liked the barred rocks um, and we had Rhode Island reds. And, um, I don't even remember there being like Americanas and stuff like that when I was a kid, but now, especially with little kids and it's like Easter eggs. So Easter eggers or Americanas, the blue, the greens. Um, I just like having a rainbow of eggs, quite frankly, because I think they're fun. So anything that can add variety to the doll, you know, is fun. So I like the the Rhode Islands, the Bard Rock, the Americanas, you know, East Riggers, whatever you want to call them. Um, oh, I'm thinking of the Well Summers. Yeah. Um, what are the black all black ones? Black Australorps. Well, Australorps. Those are some of the best layers with the Australorps. They always did really good. Um, roosters, on the other hand, sometimes those 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 Rhode Island red roosters can be a little spicy. Um, we have, we have my favorite ones, I think are the mutts where we ended up having some Easter eggers, uh, get up with some barred rocks that got up with some, uh, they're just, these so like, can you incubate yourself? Cause we have an incubator, fun, right? an egg incubator. So we, you know, roosters don't care who they're fertilizing. So make some fun varieties. I, I think my, if I could only have one chicken breed out there, I think for me, hundred percent, it'd be barred rocks. I just, I love the way they look. I love their personality. They're, I like the well layers. summer for f- color. And the, the well summer well, well summers are pretty. Are pretty, yeah. pretty. If you look at the old cornflakes rooster, I think that's a well summer. I think where so it's too. kind of that uh, rosy brown red into the green and um, all that kind of thing. But uh, boy, there's so much talk about birds, uh, guinea hens and turkeys and the ducks birds and, and the bees. And man, we could just go forever. We could go for it ever. Um, but uh, anyways, I hope uh, tonight you like this kind of a, a different approach. You know, we, we love talking about bees, but um, there's so many other things on the farms that we get into. Uh, and look how many people keep bees and also keep chickens. You, know, you guys are awesome. Everyone is awesome. Well, thank everyone for uh, tuning in tonight. Um, let us know what you want to hear next. What What are some topics that you're interested in us hearing about? You know, like we mentioned earlier, we raise a large family. We homeschool here. Um, on, on the farm, we, uh, we raise bees, we uh, raise, of course, we have our chickens, we have our cats, but we, we run the sawmill and uh, occasionally we'll tap maple trees. And it's just uh, all the things, all the things, all the things, all the things. And uh, we just love them all. Love talking to them about it. Um, and of course, um, Michelle, e- oh, she's uh, Michelle Irwin. Uh, it was great to meet, met her at the Hive Life Conference. That was cool. Raising pigs, that is definitely going to be one that we can speak to. Um, and we've got a lot, a lot of hard lessons learned too, but raising pigs is definitely, um, one of the most rewarding things, especially, um, if it's, um, something that you want to do as far as butchering is extremely rewarding too. So we could talk a lot about, uh, raising and butchering pigs. Um, that's a, years it's a great years thing too. Of experience yep. there. Yep. So it looks like, looks like, uh, already looks like some of the votes here. Maple, ta- mm-hmm. maple syrup. Okay. We've done uh, that. Maple syrup is to see, uh, it is, uh, Chris, at drop time. I just found a bunch of classic video from a couple years ago I'm going to put together oh, man. On, on maple tapping. My beard's bigger. Yeah. I'm just goofier. Uh, but uh, I, be fun. It, was, it's, it, was, it was a really fun, solid I way. I took that video for you. Yes, Not you did. so shabby. Not so shabby at all. 
any uh, any final thoughts, Susie, or anything else before we uh, uh, let these folks cut loose with the rest of their night? I have to say, if you are frazzle dazzled about these egg prices and you want to change something, we say be the change and be the lighthouse that you want to see in this world. So let's remember. If you are upset about the prices of these eggs, go support a farmer. If you want to raise them on your own, that's fabulous. But if you don't have the means or the want to do it, support somebody that's doing it. Be that change. Stop buying them at the grocery store and support somebody that's doing it because it's not free and it's not cheap and it does cost and it's getting costlier to do it. So support somebody that's doing a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, support local. You're, you're never going to go wrong. Nope. Um, when you when you support local, you'll build a friend. Whether that's um, you know buying local queens, nukes, uh, chicken, eggs, pork, beef, you name it. Building those local relationships are huge. Um, not only are you going to find local healthy uh, produce and products um, and nutrition, but you're going to build some fantastic relationships um, that are going to just go and s- surpass anything you could ever imagine. Um, sometimes I think, you know, God has put us all on this earth and we have all these things that bring us together, just like bees are a conduit to the people. Um, when you can support that local farmer, you know, where you can look them in the eye, you can shake their hand, you know, the family, um, that you're helping to support. That's a big deal. When you know where your food comes from, when you know who, um, is, is, is bringing that to you and that family, that's a big deal. Yeah. And I, from, from a large family on a small farm, I can tell you how much that that means to us. So I'm going to thank um, all you folks for not only taking a little bit of time tonight uh, to just hang out and talk about chickens, uh, but I want to thank everyone who has supported us by ordering queens, um, package bees, nukes, uh, supplies, who have been here at the Learning Yard. Um, you guys are making all this possible for us to live our dream, this large family homestead dream. Uh, we can't do it without you. And so I want to thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts uh, for making that happen um, for our family. Um, We're looking forward to talking about a lot of things as the year kind of goes out. But uh, after this video um, uh, is published and and hits YouTube, drop us some comments. Help us help us get this message out there. Share it, like it. But let us know in those comments what you want to hear next. um, And if you're enjoying these chats, if this is something you guys are finding value in and you're enjoying them, I think we're going to do them every Sunday night. Um, And who knows what the topic is going to be? It could be just about anything. Um, And so I want to thank you guys again. If you are looking um, for nukes, packages, queens, or supplies, we're taking orders right now yeah. for package bees, um, for our nukes, and also our queens. Um, and the, the, the orders are coming in uh, nicely. And I want to thank you guys a lot for that, too. Uh, don't wait around too long. If you do um, want to place those orders, um, you can go to our website at naturesimagefarm.com. You can find our contact information. If you have any questions about anything, Don't be shy. Get a hold of us. We're happy to help. That's what we're here to do. Uh, So on that note, I'm going to thank you again for spending some time with us. And I want to remind you to be the lighthouse. And be the change that you want to see in this world. We'll see you next time. Good night, guys. guys.